Matthew. Welcome everybody to Master Naturalist Present Intro to Basic Mycology 101 Mushrooms and Other Fungi. We're excited to have Eva Gordon as our presenter today. Eva has a degree in zoology and master's work in biology. She is a science educator who taught AP biology, anatomy, physiology, chemistry, and environmental science for 20 years. She was instrumental in bringing biotechnology to the SFUSD in San Mateo County School Districts. She's also taught STEM programs from elementary to high school level. Eva is currently an author, a North Texas Master Naturalist and Vice President slash Fungi Times newsletter editor of the North Texas Mycological Association. Eva is also on the Education Committee for the North American Mycological Association. Welcome, Eva, and I'll toss it to you. Thank you, and thank you for um, coming into the mushroom and uh, learning a little bit about fungi. Um, I'm sort of like the public relations person for fungi. So um, let's get started. Let's enter the mushroom. And these are a few of the things that I'm going to try to cover. Uh, I only have an hour. I usually take about an hour and a half, two hours. So if I talk fast in the beginning, that's because I want to get to the really good stuff, looking at specific mushrooms that you might run across here in North, um, North Texas. So these are the few things I'm going to cover. Uh, Fungi's unique or fungi's unique characteristics, uh, basic taxonomy. Um, I don't know. I'm assuming most of you have a good background. That's why I might talk quickly. Um, a little bit of mushroom anatomy, life cycle, uh, and then of course the importance of mushrooms in our world, the ecology, uh, the importance of fungi in possibly saving our planet. And I'm going to focus on two major phyla fungi. Um, Basidio mycota and Ascomycota, um, because those are the ones that you're readily going to see when you go out hiking, you know, so you're not going to see the microscopic ones or the ones that live within the plant cells. So um, that's where we're going to go. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit on how to identify and of course the elephant or the mushroom in the room, uh, the poisonous mushrooms, which um, uh, people are paranoid and scared, and uh, which is makes sense, but uh, most of the mushrooms are not poisonous. So we're going to go a little bit into that. And the new age of mycophilia, the love of for mushrooms rather than the fear, mycophobia. So anyway, um, let's see, I'm trying to get rid of this little light thing here. Okay. The important uh, fungi are extremely important in our past and very critical in our future. Um, Approximately 500 million years ago, fungi paved the waves for plants and animals to invade land. And some of the oldest fossils known are um, over a billion years old. And this one happens to be uh, a fungus. So that was recently. So again, um, very interesting past, but we're not gonna spend too much time, but just know that without fungi, we wouldn't have invaded land. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, 1969, very important year because that's when um, we first landed on the moon. And that was when uh, uh, fungi were recognized as being in their own kingdom, which always surprises people because here we have this great technology to go to the moon. And it took us this long to realize that uh, fungi are in their own kingdom. Okay. And now we officially have one, two, three, four, five, six. Some of these are broken down, but for uh, just to show you that uh, fungi are now separated from all the other kingdoms. And uh, oh, this little thing here. Major fungi characteristics, uh, they're eukaryotics, uh, which means they have a true nuclear membrane. And um, so, those of you who are master naturalists or have a good biology background, you probably already know these terms, but I'm just going to go basically over um, some of these terms. They're heterotrophic, which means they cannot make their own food like plants. They digest their food, they uh, secrete digestive enzymes, and they have what's called absorptive nutrition. So they just kind of go on the surface of whatever they're eating and excrete the enzymes. Um, unlike uh, plants, because 
they've always been thought of as plants. They have chitin in a cell wall instead of cellulose. And the chitin is the same material you, you see in arthropods, you know, crabs, and insects. Uh, they have a unique sterol in their cell membrane, car ergosterol. Okay, so again, that makes them unique. And for the most part, they're multicellular. And they're actually clo more closely related to uh, animals than they are plants. So we're closely related and uh, continue. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on uh, other groups, but um, we're still working on the fungi tree of life. Um, there's still a lot of questions because technically it's a newer science. Uh, there was a time when um, mycology was in the basement of the botany department. So they were like lesser plants. But now that we know that they're uh, in their own kingdom, we're just studying them. It's a separate kingdom now, let's see. Uh, there's a vast diversity in kingdom fungi. As you can see, um, there's some that are microscopic and yes, most are multicellular, but there are a lot that are unicellular. Unlike plants and animals, only 5% of the fungi have been described. Up to 3.8 million still need to be identified. So mycologists all around the world need the help of citizen scientists like the master naturalist or um, you know, uh, amateur mycologists to go around and help identify all these uh, fungi, fungi that have not been identified. And DNA sequencing has become really critical and they're catching up, trying to figure out if that same mushroom that's found in Europe is the same mushroom found here. And sometimes we realize that it's no, it's a, it's a different species. Okay, so basic taxonomy or classification. I don't want to spend too much time on this. I'm assuming that most people are familiar with the, you know, taxonomic hierarchy. Um, but just know that they have their own kingdom. Within that kingdom, we have several phyla, and we could probably spend a whole year discussing all the different phyla of um, kingdom fungi, class, order, family, genus, and species. So. Um, the interesting thing about um, studying mycology is that most mycologists use scientific names, and I'm sure plant uh, biologists do as well for the most part, but uh, we're pretty good about that. So we, we use scientific names. For example, this is Amanita muscaria, which you have all seen. I always start with this one because this is probably the most familiar. It is the most familiar mushroom in the entire world. And uh, we use an ancient language, dead language, Latin Greek, ancient Greek to name. And so this one, Amanita muscaria, uh, Amanti is Greek uh, for mushroom and muscaria means fly. And the common name is fly agaric, okay? So, um, but we try to stay away from common names. Oops, okay, now I need to know how to go back, hold on. I need to go, okay, um, okay, let's make this big, hold on, I guess. apologize for that. Okay, so um, this is our uh, common uh, Texas star, it's not so common, it's only found in a few places on the, around the world, Japan and Texas, and it has a scientific name, Coriactus jaster. And unfortunately, because a common name is, can be different, um, it's better to use a scientific name. And this is our state mushroom. It's really cool that Texas is one of the few states that actually has an official state mushroom. And um, which is not surprising because this mushroom's um, also only found in Japan. So, and, uh, in another form, it looks like a cigar, but when it opens up, it looks like a star. So that's why we wanna stay away from common names. Let's see. Okay, mycology terms can be very confusing, um, but as you become more familiar with uh, mycology, you start to learn the parts and it, it becomes really easy after a while. You'll be fluent in no time. And here, this cartoon is just an example of people speaking in scientific terms and, you know, you want to just call it toast when it's pulverized grain and fermentation fungus calorified over a charged particle heat source. So basically all she's saying is toast. 
And that's what a mycologist probably sound like to the layman. Okay. All right. So most people start mycology with showing a big, beautiful mushroom and all the parts, but I like to start with the mycelium, the fungal vegetative body. And um, as you can see, it looks like the spider, uh, spider web type uh, substance on this rotting log. But for mo um, most of what you're seeing happens to be mycelium, which is the vegetative body. Um, the hyphae are the thread-like filaments found uh, collectively become the mycelium. So and the mycelium is singular from bundle of hyphae that form the network. And we'll talk a little bit more about the underground network. And mycelia is plural. Um, so here you see it visible on the bark. And you could also see it on your bread when it gets moldy. So this is where all the action is happening. Okay, so this is where all the exchange of nutrients and growth happens. And unfortunately, you rarely spot the mycelium because it's deep within the soil or on a rotten log. So no one's you know, turning over rotten logs to look for mycelium. This is a fungal body that spreads out and feeds. This is uh, exchange of nutrients. When conditions are good, the mycelium will push up a mushroom or the fruiting body. So when we look at a mycelium, think of an apple tree and the mushroom is the apple. So uh, most scientists will study the apple tree, but in mycology, we're sometimes forced to study the fruiting body, which is the mushroom. Uh, if we have time, I'll come back and talk a little bit about the society to pre protect the underground network and why that's important. But right now, I just wanna make sure I get to cover um, all the topics. Okay, here's a basic mushroom life cycle. So the mycelium um, conditions are right, the pH, uh, salinity, uh, moisture, the right temperature of the soil, um, everything's perfect, and the mycelium starts to form this hyphal knot. And this hyphal knot eventually becomes a primordia, and if conditions are really good, it turns into the fruiting body or the mushroom. And the mushroom then spreads its spores, germination happens, then we have the hyphae and the hyphae start collecting and form the mycelium. So it's, this is typical of the mushroom life cycle. And here we have a little bit about mushroom anatomy. Don't worry about the picture. There's a lot of information on this slide. And, but basically I just, and mycoterms, which you could always come back to, but this is just an introduction. Um, so basically the, the mushroom itself is made up this one is made up of a cap and the stipe, which is, looks like a stem, and then the bottom part, the vulva, which then feeds into the mycelium. So um, in the mycolingo, the pileus is the cap, the margin is the edge of the cap, and all these terms become important when you're trying to identify. But right now, if this is an introductory course, you don't wanna take it you know, too seriously have to learn all these parts for now. So, um, but you will hear the term the universal veil. The universal veil in the mushroom is what covers a developing mushroom. That little primordia you saw was probably covered by a universal veil and it will expand and um, vertically and then slough away. The partial veil is a membrane that covers the gills or the pores up here, again, to protect it until it's ready to release the pores. And sometimes you have a remainder of that partial veil um, and it's usually called the, um, the skirt, the ring, or in Latin, the annulus. Okay, so now not all mushrooms have gills. Some have pores, some have teeth-like structures. So we'll turn over here, a closer view of different spore-producing surfaces. Probably most of you are familiar with the gilled ones because those are the ones that are famous, but, um, and the ones that you get at grocery stores. But you probably, uh, if you go grocery shopping for chanterelles or other mushrooms, you probably have seen ridges. And then if you like bolides, probably seen pores. And then we have mushrooms that have these 
tooth-like structures for releasing spores. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the fungal role in ecology. And this is extremely important. Um, this is probably the most important thing that um, fungi are known for. So um, they have a really important symbiotic relationship with plants. And the ones that have this relationship with plants are called mycorrhizal. They offer nutrients to the plants, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, they help retain water. Um, they protect them from diseases. Um, and the plant is overall healthier. Plants in return offer carbohydrates, vitamins, and essential nutrients for the growth or the fungus. There's two types of mycorrhizal relationships. There's the endomycorrhizal, and these are um, these um, fungi live within the cell wall and the cell membrane of the plants. So you don't see these, but these are probably the most important uh, mycorrhizal relationship between plants and fungi or fungi. And so you rarely see this, but 80% of plants have this sort of relationship. Ectomycorrhizal uh, relationship, ecto means out, as you know, surrounds the lateral roots of plants and they don't penetrate like the endo do. And they form a sheath called the heart net. And the mycorrhizal uh, mushrooms are the ones you see popping out like the muscaria we saw earlier, popping out from the soil and underneath the mycelium has a relationship with the trees. And if you've ever read um, uh, the book by Suzanne Simerod on the mother tree, searching for the mother tree, she talks about how forest and the lumber industry is really better off if they allow a mycorrhizal relationship between um, the fungi and the, uh, the trees. Okay. And we'll come back to that. Another important symbiotic relationship or um, partnership is known are the lichens. Another well-known, yeah. Uh, the fungi benefit from the carbohydrates produced by the algae or the cyanobacteria via photosynthesis. And the algae or cyanobacteria benefit by being protected from the environment by the filaments of the fungi and allows for a substrate, something to hang on to. So again, these are pioneer type organisms. So they set the tone for other life entering the environment. Really important. Uh, another really important ecological role for the mushrooms are as saprobes or they're saprotrophic. Uh, we used to say saprophilic, but we want to stay away from plants. So now called saprobes. These are the decomposers. They break down organic matter to make energy and return minerals back to the environment. These nutrients are important to plant life. And in the forest, they're responsible for like 90% of decomposition. Only fungi can break down lignin, which is found in wood. So without fungi, um, you would not have room for people or anything else because you'd be littered with litter, wood, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So very important. Um, ecological role. They recycle all the nutrients back. Okay, um, other important ecological roles are that of tree pathogens. Um, these are fungi pathogens that attack a living tree and slowly kill it. Sometimes it takes years and years to slowly kill it. And these are uh, honey mushrooms that I took pictures of um, near the Oklahoma border earlier this year. They're examples of tree pathogens. And the largest mushroom in the world, um, the humongous fungus in Oregon, uh, they are honey mushrooms and they are slowly killing all the trees there. So really interesting. Okay. Um, parasitic fungi. Uh, these are the ones that everybody talks about that zombie zombify ants and other insects. They feed off the living. Um, this is an example of uh, a fungus that's feeding off an ant, Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. Um, they literally turn the ant into a zombie. They kind of con take control of it and it, it does whatever it says. It goes and, and plants itself on the top layer of the tree and grabs a leaf and then all the spores are released and 
the ant is dead. So uh, other diseases such as Dutch elm, ringworm, athlete's foot, to name a few, are examples of parasitic fungi. And um, most of us, when we're learning about mycology, this is what we focus on. We always focus on the bad ones. And true, there are a lot of bad ones, but the ecological world kind of outweighs all that negative uh, parasitic uh, role that they play. All right, so um, despite their importance, mycology is the most neglected field of the biological sciences. That's why I kind of decided to, now in my life to focus away from zoology and biology and just stay with mycology because a lot of research is needed and I'm happy to uh, inoculate everybody with, um, you know, learning uh, mycology. So thanks to documentaries such as Paul Salmon's Fantastic Fungi and his uh, Six Ways That Mushrooms Will Save the World um, on um, TED Talks, uh, we are now getting a lot more people interested in uh, mycology. So uh, Merlin Sheldrick's Entangled Life um, also is really popular and it, it brought life to mycology. That's a really popular book. Um, and people are starting to realize the importance of our health and sustainability and the planet's sustainability based on mushrooms. And these are oyster mushrooms. Um, they grow on trees, they're decomposers, and they're decomposing one of his books, uh, Tangled Life. So we'll talk a little bit. Um, mushroom cultivation is extremely important. Um, edibles are um, now being grown at your grocery store. I took this picture from Central Market that now grows its own lion's mane and blue oysters. And um, it's good to eat mushrooms, especially if you're a vegan or a vegetarian. They're high in fiber, vitamin D, and good source of protein. And it's very sustainable. You can be extremely poor, and if you get your uh, bag of mushrooms, you can actually grow your own food. And it's cheap, and it's fast. Um, we all know the food industry depends on uh, fungi. Without fungi, there would be no breads, cheese, wine, beer, and on and on and on. You just go on and all the foods that would be eliminated if we didn't have this great kingdom. Mushroom forays. You can actually go out and, buy, uh, and um, find your own mushrooms to eat. So finding edible wild mushrooms is now a, a big part of a lot of foray foraging groups. Um, we take our, our um, groups on forays. Uh, these morels came from uh, Denison. We went on a big two-day foray there with our group. And sure enough, we found morels. Not as many as we normally would have because of the drought in Dallas, but enough to probably feed a lot of people. Um, they're pretty expensive at the grocery store. Um, another great thing about uh, fungi is they can help help us get away from uh, using um, materials that ruin the environment. Okay, for example, you can make faux leather um, and that way you avoid raising cattle for leather, which affects climate change and its whole tanning process is extremely toxic. So it's good to turn to other materials. Um, building materials, future homes made of mycelium bricks. Um, I hope to someday build a little house out of mycelium bricks, but it's a long, it's a slow, long process, but I'm hoping this industry will catch up to that. Packing materials are using mycelium now to pack a lot of materials, very environmental, very sustainable. IKEA is doing that and a few other companies. So anyway, let's continue. Okay, uh, micro remediation. Fungi can break down chemical pollutants including oil and pesticides, and a whole slew of hydrocarbons. Um, they can extract or bind heavy metals and radiation. They can filter water. They can initiate and support many life cycles that help regenerate ecosystems that have been damaged. Okay, so the easiest way to uh, repair an ecosystem is to bring back the uh, fungi that really belong there. So oyster mushrooms, for example, can break down toxic hydrocarbons, including oil um, and a lot of other materials, um, especially heavy metals. You, you want to, um, in order to get gold from, you know, when you find gold, 
pure gold out, you have to use these really bad toxins. But if you use mushrooms, then you can avoid using that and you get the gold or whatever it is um, that a lot of poor nations do so that we can have good stuff. Anyway, so, um, and the uh, fungi in Chernobyl, they're doing quite well actually. So it's kind of interesting. Um, this is Pestiolopsis microspora. This is a plastic eating mushroom that's found in the Amazon. Not the Amazon that you see on the internet, but the Amazon area in Ecuador. And it actually will eat plastic. This is a sample that I got from um, one of our speakers and it's eating the plastic inside. And I'm hoping to have a bucket um, and then feed it plastic and see what happens. But it's quite happy to eat plastic and it'll eventually eat through that little Petri plate or dish. Uh, fungi for what ails us, medicinal mushrooms. Uh, everybody knows the story of Alexander Fleming and discovery of penicillin. So really important in the world of antibiotics um, and um, still a really important science because a lot of bacteria are becoming more and more, uh, you know, they're not being killed off by antibiotics. Uh, statins, uh, blood thinners come from uh, using fungi. Um, a lot of studies on cancer um, and fantastic fungi. Uh, Paul Stammons talks about how the turkey tail mushroom, Hermides here, hello, helped save his mother from stage four breast cancer. So again, more studies need to be uh, done in that area. Mental health, there's a lot of research being done or has been done um, in terms of PTSD, anxiety, depression, and how using psilocybin um, actually help. Uh, often cure depression like in one, one microdose or one macrodose probably. Okay. All right, so now we're getting to um, the different mushroom types that you might run across. Um, I have probably about 30 mushroom books, but for traveling around, this is, I, I picked the National Audubon Society one, um, even though it has some drawbacks, it's in, it uses common names, but you'll find the scientific names. But I use this one because it's set up so that you can easily identify what type of mushroom it is based on pictures and uh, other characteristics. Um, I'll try to uh, quickly go through the 15 major groups that you will see if you walk in, you know, in the green space, like when you leave you possibly run across some of these. Okay, we're gonna start off with the guild mushrooms real quick, um, also known as the agarics. This is a very large, diverse group. These are the, um, the ones that we love to photograph. Um, these are the ones we love to eat. So they're easily observable. They can be complicated to identify, however. And, but you will notice the gills and the spores um, are produced in those gills. So it's really interesting. You can actually collect the spore and do a spore print later on. We'll discuss that. Um, this one's one of the gilled mushrooms I found in the grassy area in front of my apartment building. This is Leuco agaricus, leucothides. Um, but if you just look at it, it looks like the death cap, you know, but there's certain ways that you could, oops, there I go again. I went backwards, hold on. Okay. Okay, there we go. Best not to touch the screen. Yeah. So uh, many gilled mushrooms are edible, such as portobello. And again, a few are poisonous, such as a death cap, which we're gonna get to in a little, in a little bit. Okay. There we go. Here's another view. So some gilled mushrooms are huge um, and others are really, really small. And the really small ones are my favorite. Um, the one on the right I found in a Spring Creek Nature Preserve underneath a log, so very small. So I'm always looking under logs specifically for the small gilt mushrooms. Um, there's also a group of mushrooms called Russulas, and they're known because they have splitting gills. And you're probably going to run across these if you go um, in a grassy area, especially after rain, you might see a Russula. And, um, they're brittle, so one way you can find out that they are Russula is that they will actually make like a break sound, like a chalk. They break, the stems break like chalks. 
And another type of bacilla, Lactarius, uh, secretes this latex that looks like milk. Sometimes people say it secretes milk, but we know it's not milk, just like we know oat milk is not milk and almond milk is not milk. Uh, folates, these are also very common. They're mycorrhizal, they're um, like the racillas. They like to grow mostly near oak trees around here in um, Texas. They're soft and fleshy. The cap is very different from the stem, as you can see. Um, the they have tubes instead of um, that produce spores instead of gills. So you'll see, under that's why it's really important to take a picture of a mushroom's uh, underside so we can find out if it's got gills or pores. Those are the bolites. Okay, so these are the polypores. These are the ones you're gonna probably see if you walk into the forest right this very minute. These are the shelf mushrooms and these are decomposers. They're all saprobes. And so that's why they're around all the time because there's always something rotting and sure enough, there's always something uh, decomposing it. Tremides versicolor is a common uh, turkey tail. And uh, that one you will see, leathery to woody. Some polypores are extremely hard and some are really soft. So just thousands of species. So um, the spores are in the tubes. Okay, just like the bolis. Chanterelles, um, these are easy to identify. Um, they're usually pretty small and there's some lookalikes you wanna stay away from, but we'll talk a little bit about that later. There, um, they have the bore bearing surfaces occur on the underside of the cap and range from smooth to wrinkled. All right, so this is something that you might run across right now. Um, if we get a few more rains, uh, this is our chanterelle season in North Texas. So um, we're gonna be going on a few forays and we hope to find some chanterelles. And we're, our club is having a talk on finding Texas chanterelles um, on June 4th. So I'll tell you how you can sign up for that class. Um, so these are also mycorrhizal. In other words, they're gonna be growing from the soil, not on anything that's rotting. And again, they're related to certain, they like to be around certain trees. Um, if you go into the woods right now, you're also gonna see crust and parchment fungi. These grow flat on wood. They're often mistaken for uh, polypores, but they're not. And, but they're all saprobes, none are edible. And, um, but they don't have spore, they don't have pores on the underside. So it, they feel like paper when you pick one up it's just flat like paper and there's no pores. So pores are produced by the smooth hard surface. So very different from the polypores. Okay, some of the toothed mushrooms that you might run across, um, such as the lion's mane, which is uh, a very favorite uh, mushroom for foodies. And uh, like I said, Central Market grows its own lion's mane or Ericium erinaceus. And uh, if you're walking in the forest, like say in the fall and you look up, you might see some lion's mane. Um, this one here is a hedgehog mushroom and probably because of the little spines here, it looks like a hedgehog. And that one's another example of a toothed mushroom. So that's where their spores are produced. Puffballs and earth balls. A few species like Elvaltia gigantea are enormous reaching up to 50 centimeters. Earth stars are included in this group. Um, and so these look like giant balls. Very, the um, inside, these are a favorite food. The inside should be wa uh, white like marshmallow. And if it's not, it's probably poisonous. So a very diverse group. They're all very diverse. Um, I wanna mention a little bit about Scleroderma saturnium, another puffball, because it's poisonous and, um, this is a, uh, one reason why a lot of dogs and even cats end up in the um, emergency room because they'll eat them. So make sure um, if you see one and if you cut it in half, it will be black flesh inside. So um, very important that you, if it's on your property, you get rid of it if you have dogs. So I found this one in my apartment lot and I just go through and pick them up because we have a lot of dogs in our apartment building. 
Um, these are the corals, very beautiful. Uh, spores produced on the outside, usually not edible. But they look like corals. Stinkhorns, very diverse group. Um, there are a lot of stinkhorns here in North Texas, so eventually you'll see one. But before you see it, you'll probably smell it. It smells really, really bad. It smells like a dead decomposing body, um, which attracts flies and other insects, and um, that helps spread the, the um, spores. They're all saprobes, so they're all digesting something, litter, or you know something that's on the ground. This one I found in Tyler, but people have found them here in um, this area. Jellies, uh, jelly um, fungi are found all over. Um, I found a group in uh, Spring Creek Nature Preserve. It's got a lot of um, these jelly type fungi and they're gelatinous when they're moist. And then when, when it's Drought-like conditions, like right now, they become really dry, and you don't even know that they're uh, they're uh, fungi. So again, this covers a variety of species, and um, the only way to really identify them is to use a microscope, look at their spores and other parts. Okay, um, this one is another type of mushroom you might run across if you start digging around in the grass. Um, this looks like something out of a Tim Burton um, movie. It's called the Bird Nest Fungus. And this one I found in Capel um, outside of uh, Goat Rodeo, Rodeo Goat, a restaurant. And if you wanna look for these little guys, they're tiny, but look for where the uh, sprinkler system is. So again, they sporulate by um, getting drops of water on the surface here, really cool. Okay, now we are entering the sac fungi, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on yeast cells or sarcomycetes. Everybody's familiar with this, the whole process. So we're gonna go through some of the ones that you'll see in the wild or in. So uh, cups and saddles, you might run across these. Again, uh, not too common when there's drought conditions, but uh, if it's all moist and after a good couple of rains, you might run across these. Morels, as I mentioned earlier, uh, favorite uh, edible, Morchella esculanta, uh, favorite edible, but watch out for lookalikes. Um, there's one called the brain moral that's toxic or poisonous. And so stay away from that one. But we offer classes. Um, this summer, we're offering another class on uh, edibles versus the lookalikes that are poisonous. So um, if you wanna pursue uh, forays and foraging your own mushrooms, you might wanna consider taking that class. Truffles, everybody knows about truffles, how expensive they are. It's a fruity body of a subterranean Ascomycetes fungi. Um, and so there, um, the genus is tuber. And believe it or not, uh, we do have truffles here in uh, Texas because uh, pecan, the pecan tree has a mycorrhizal relationship with truffles. So it's possible, um, and this is something that really needs to be researched, it's possible that we have uh, truffles that we could actually harvest here and possibly sell. And truffles are, um, uh, their locations are hidden in Europe and stuff because people want to, um, you know, find them and sell them. I, I saw one black truffle, I think last year at Central Market. It was a really, really tiny one. I think it was going for $300 and they had it under a glass piece, but a lot of them you know, can go up to $1,000. And people use dogs and pigs to look for the truffles. So that's my dog. She's not quite, so we're working on truffle training. Um, how do I identify mushrooms? Okay, we're getting towards the end. So I'm gonna kind of rush through these. Um, Start by getting familiar with mushroom guides, uh, go on forays, you know, um, stay away from mushroom apps. If you're going out to find something to eat, don't use, don't ever use a mushroom app because AI is always wrong. So it might identify something that's extremely poisonous and say it's edible. So uh, I use mushroom apps just for reading while I'm waiting for the dentist or something because it has a lot of good information, but I, I wouldn't use them to identify. 
Um, so when you're out in the field, note the soil, the wood, um, what season is it? Uh, like morels, they come out in April, you know, May, and the temperature has to be like 50 degrees for like 100 days, I think. So all weather and season is very critical. The species of tree or plant it's growing next to is really critical. Mushrooms can be very specific about the tree it works with, the mycorrhizal ones, or the one it decomposes. So the Texas star, for example, loves elm trees. So if you're looking for Texas stars in the fall, you have to look for elm trees that they are decomposing. How numerous is it? Uh, is it uh, single growing cl clusters, also known as cespitose? Um, and are they in troops? Are they in fairy rings? Shape of cap and stem, if present, very important. Um, how do I identify continuing? How are the gills, if any, attached? Is there a universal veil? Is there a vulva or the bottom part of the stem that we looked at earlier? Um, is there a partial veil left as an annulus? How is it colored? Color can be very subjective. So what looks brown to me might look pumpkin to you, that sort of thing. Texture, is it scaly, viscid, which means slimy? Does it have a netted pattern? Um, does it look fibrous? What happens when you cut or bruise it? Some, some mushrooms will actually leak um, latex. Others will leak something that looks like red blood. Others will turn blue if you, you know, break the stem. So all these are really important in identification. Um, you might want to have a handy guide such as this one, okay, where it ask you, you know, the conditions, living tree, uh, the shape of the cap, et cetera, et cetera. How do I identify continue? Uh, another good way to identify a mushroom is to smell it. Many mushrooms have a distinct odor, such as cinnamon, fishy odor, apricot-like odor, garlic, bleach, or dead corpus, like the stink horn. So um, smell is really important. Even if it just smells like your usual mushroom, that's really indicative of what it might be. Uh, some people actually taste it, never swallow, uh, not recommended, do not do this. Many will break, many mycologists will break a piece, taste it, and spit it out. Now, even really poisonous mushrooms, you can actually touch and hold, and you don't have to worry about it. The only uh, reason you would worry about it is if you actually ate it. So touching a poisonous mushroom is not going to uh, hurt you. So it's best to capture with a camera, making sure you get the gills, the stem, substrate down and show size or scale. I use iNaturalist a lot to send a share and or share with uh, Facebook identification groups. So if you take pictures and you know some brilliant mycologists like our president, Sebastian Tavivi will look at it and know ex um, exactly what it is. So make friends with mycologists. Um, how do I identify? Continued. If you really want to go out, all out, you can make a spore print. And um, we're going to provide all these links after the talk. But you basically cut off the cap, you know, put it on a piece of paper. I use aluminum foil in case the spores happen to be white. This one happens to be brown, so you can see it. And leave it. I usually leave it overnight and come back, and you can tell the spore color. Because the spore color tells you a lot about what species it is. So, very important. Uh, other people use reagents, and if you take one of our classes, we're going to go into that. And um, so you can note the reaction. If you really, really need to know what it is, if you think it's an entirely different species, you could always send it off for DNA sequencing, which would be great. And go as on many forays as possible. Okay, the elephant in the room, the poisonous ones, uh, never munch on a hunch. And my favorite saying is there are old mycologists and there are bold mycologists. And I happen to want to be an old one because I do not want to risk eating something. I do not know what it is. So never eat wild mushrooms unless beyond the shadow of a doubt, you know exactly what it is. Because for every edible one, there's a lookalike that's not. Um, while you are a newbie, I would avoid parasol shaped white gills little brown mushrooms and false morals, as well as other species that look like edible variety. So while you're a newbie, do not eat anything that you find in the wild until it's completely identified. Always cook before eating. 
you actually, um, I know a lot of people like raw foods, but you actually get more nutrients if you cook a mushroom. Uh, because of the chitin in the cell wall, if you just eat it raw, it's just going to go through. So you're not going to get the vitamin K or vitamin D that you would normally get. 90% um, of fatalities are caused by the death cap, Amanita phylloides, um, and it looks just like this. And, you know, even some of the edibles look just like that. Um, Claudius, one of the emperors, was poisoned because his favorite uh, food was the um, Amanita cesarea, which is edible. And his wife, I guess, arranged it so that he would eat the bad phylloides, and that's how he died. Um, Amanita biosporigera is found here in North Texas. Um, well, parts of Texas. So watch out for that one. It's the destroying angel. Um, it's very poisonous, just like the other one. And in, I think it was the 50s or the 60s, uh, ranch family in San Antonio found these, ate them, and I think the entire family died of um, this poisoning. Uh, there was one member who survived who decided not to eat mushrooms for that one meal. Uh, you can find all sorts of information in NAMA, the North American Mycological Association. So um, that's where you get all this information. They have education. They have everything about uh, poisoning and what type of poisons there are. And we can do a whole class just on the different types of poisons. Mycophilia is... Uh, really becoming popular even before Fantastic Fungi uh, was released. Uh, there's been celebrations of, you know, just mushrooms. And uh, so this is where it looks hippie-like, but there are a lot of uh, mycologists that like to go and, and experience Telluride, for example. Mushroom communities are on the rise. Citizen science is on the rise. Uh, we need more citizen scientists looking at mushrooms. So. Um, there is a growing respect now knowing that mushrooms can help us with remediation and helping uh, plants absorb more carbon and all that good stuff. So very important. Uh, science fiction, fantasy literature, more and more is coming out on mushrooms. Sometimes on the darker side, they like to make a big deal about the mushroom that um, infects insects and that sort of thing. Anyway, so, and this is uh, the North Texas Mycological Association, which if you want to learn more, we have classes, we have forays, about two forays a month. We have a class once a month at the um, Agri Building in Dallas near 635. So you're all welcome to join. And uh, here's some of the resources. These are some of my favorite books, uh, Mushrooms of the Gulf Coast. There's an old Texas mushroom book, but it's it's really old and has, you know, you can't find it. But Mushrooms of the Gulf Coast um, probably gives you a good idea of most of the mushrooms here. So, and now I'm open for questions. If there are any questions? So, um, let's see. Okay, good. I did, uh, Eva, uh, I added your, the, the chat, your um, uh, resources. So okay. we do have a question from uh, uh, Caitlin. Uh, she says, you mentioned more events. How do we learn about those? About what? The, you mentioned uh, that there were more events. Oh, now yes. Um, the, you, can join, you can go on our uh, webpage to North Texas Mycological Association. Um, it's, I think it's called, the, it, it's on the, um, it's the North Texas Mycological Association, uh, northtexasmycology.org. And I think it, that's listed under the uh, comments somewhere or the resources. And we have events all the time. Uh, Non-members pay an extra fee. Uh, if you become a member, um, I think it's like $25 a year, you can go on all the forays for free and the classes you get a discount. So um, it's, it's kind of worth it if you really want to get into mushrooms to become a member. And we're actually planning a big, we had a big event um, in Denison uh, in last, yeah, last fall. And we're going to have a, last spring, and we're going to have a bigger one in the fall in um, Denton. 
And we're going to have Alan Rockefeller, which um, if you know anything about mushrooms, he's like the biggest DNA sequencer. He's going to bring his $15,000 uh, microscope and teach us microscopy um, and identification. So that's happening uh, October 28th around Halloween. So um, yeah, and feel free to ask me um, about events. And we have a big Facebook group too. So yeah. Next question from Ben. Uh, uh, any chance you could share samples from the plastic eating fungus? Um, yeah, I can get a hold of samples. Um, let's see. Um, what, I think Jen, our uh, club secretary, she's got quite a few cultures of and I, I can share mine too. I have it in a Petri dish. I could just, you know, uh, take samples. And oh, the good news is every foray, we now are giving little uh, micro uh, tubes of um, spore uh, mushrooms that you can actually grow yourself. So the spores, so you can just get a, a bag and, and start growing, you know, a grain bag and you can start growing your own. So, because we're, we're cultivating our own spores now from the wild. So members get free samples. Heather said, I was curious if you were aware of any mycology groups that meet closer to Fort Worth. Um, that's, yeah, we do have forays. We had a foray at Fort Worth um, a couple months ago. Um, but you're talking about classes in that area. All of our classes are on Zoom. So if it's a major inconvenience, um, but we have the building is in Dallas, so we have access to it and that it has a classroom and a big screen and we could um, hook up our projector. But um, if anybody wants a talk in Fort Worth, then you can contact us and we could probably send somebody. So that's not a problem because we cover all of North Texas. Okay. So this is a question from ben, Benjamin. He says, what happens when the plastic eating mushrooms escape into our plasticized industrial environment? That's right. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, um, now, even though plastic is really, we know waste, uh, all the waste in the ocean and all the bad plastic, you know, is really bad. But um, our medical industry depends on plastics. I mean, you know, our syringes and medical bags and all that. So, I don't think that would happen. Um, the one that I have in my Petri dish, it, uh, it wouldn't survive here in Texas. It needs the tropics. It needs to be in Ecuador. So even if it escaped, it would die pretty quickly. So, but um, I'm still, uh, you know, I'm an experiment. I'm hoping that students like um, middle school kids are interested or high school kids for science fairs would be an interesting experiment to see how well it breaks down di different types of plastic. On that topic, uh, Amber has a question. At the foray at Arbor Hills, you mentioned having a class for teachers to introduce mycology into their education systems. How do you sign up for that? Oh, okay. That one's through the um, Capel Nature Biodiversity Center. So um, that one, I think she posted it on the Master Naturalist calendar. So if you're a master naturalist, uh, it will be there. And if you're not, um, you know, if you're a teacher and you want to learn more, then um, we'll have to, you can contact us or me, you know, um, and then I can give you the information or the link, so. Okay. Uh, Emily asks, do you need to be a member of the North Texas Mycological Group to join the Facebook group or is it open to anyone? Oh, the Facebook group is open to anyone and you can even sign up for our newsletter. That's open to anybody as well. So, because we have, we have members from Washington state, from New York, you know, cause when, once you become obsessed with mushrooms, you want to learn about mushrooms in different states. So, and I'm a member of quite a few of myself. So. Pamela asks, what conditions are necessary for stinkhorns to develop? They have shown up in my backyard a couple of times. Oh, probably after a good rain. Yeah. Yeah, um, stink horns, you know, they're sap probes. So there's something there that needs to be decomposing like uh, leaf litter. 
So if you clear all your leaves, um, if you have you know a lot of leaves in your yard, you might want to clear that out. Uh, they do stink, so I can understand why you don't want them, but um, but they ha they help decompose. So. Okay. It says I know several folks in the Fort Worth area who'd love a talk. She says she's Burleson uh, at Heather. We could exchange info and set something up with a speaker from Eva's group. So, yeah, that would be. Um, does everybody have my email? <laughs> well, you, Greg, you have my email, right? You can. Yes. You can, uh, yes, I can. Uh, I can include your email in the follow up. Uh, okay. Send out for the people yeah. attended the presentation. Mm -hmm. Right, because we have we have a. Uh, um, one of our board members, Leah, she's she's usually uh, leads forays in Alaska, but she lives in Fort Worth. So he uh, lives part time in Alaska and part time in Fort Worth. So if we could arrange it so that he's available, that would be great. Marty would like to know, uh, can the plastic eating mushrooms help with ocean cleanup? Do you know if that's something that's been considered? That's something that's being considered. Um, probably not the one that I showed you that's from the Amazon. Um, they do have uh, marine fungi that are um, able to like break down the plastics. So they're uh, probably, that's at the experimental stage. That would be good. Um, especially since we're eating and consuming a lot of the microplastic material, you know, a lot of sea turtles, everybody's eating the really bad stuff. So um, yeah, that's something that needs to be researched and looked at. That will be the solution, I think. Um, but we do have to be careful. Also bacteria, let's not ignore bacteria. Bacteria are faster at um, doing the same thing that fungi do as well. So if we can find bacteria that's eating plastic, that might speed up the process. <laughs> but again, um, we do have to be careful because even though we all hate plastic, we can't, at this point, it's, it's so convenient, but um, I would, I'm probably trying to switch over to another product rather than plastic. I use a lot of different products instead of plastic. So, you know, like bags for grocery shopping, that sort of thing. So. Getting lots of thank yous coming in and uh, positive comments about how good the presentation was. And oh, thank you. It, information contained. So we appreciate everybody's feedback. Uh, thank you. I'll remind y'all that uh, the recording for this is going to be posted um, later today or possibly at the beginning of next week. I'm going to go ahead and post the website where you can get to uh, this recording when it's available and also the other recordings uh, for the Master Naturalist series. So uh, I have shortly after 12 uh, more thank yous coming in. Uh, any final questions? Uh... Are there any final questions? Um, yeah, so he'll send out my email and uh, you could also, uh, there's a contact. Um, well, it's better to email me. Um, I'm on Facebook as well. Join the Facebook group and then you can also uh, message us. Um, it's for Facebook. I don't have the uh, link there, but it's just look up North Texas Mycological Association which it looks like I kind of misspelled there, <laughs> kind of stuttered. Um, anyway, so, well, thank you for- Sure, we uh, have uh, one more question and this, okay. will, this can be the last one. Uh, let's see here. Uh, can the fungi help with oil spills? Yep, I mean, um, they have oyster mushrooms and a few other species are actually eating oil. So the answer is yes. So um, the question is, we need more research and we need to be going in that direction. Because I don't know if you guys remember CFCs um, that were making the ozone layer disappear. We actually fixed that by getting rid of CFCs. So we can actually fix things. You know, we just have to put our mind to it. So um, that's a positive uh, look because you know, with climate change and oil spills, it's so gloomy, but um, doing research in mycology is really giving us hope that we can actually change things for the better. So, right, right. mushrooms. <laughs>
Thank you once again, Eva, and thank you everybody for coming. And before everybody ducks out, I just want to post one final thing in the chat. Uh, our next Master Naturalist present presentation, we've got that on the calendar. It's pollinators. you got to love them. On June 18th at 11 a.m., uh, Janet Smith, one of our Master Naturalists, is going to be doing that class. So we hope that many of you can join us for that as well. So thank you again, everybody, for coming, and thanks, Eva. Thank you. Oh, stop share here. Okay, there we go. Let's see. Uh...